And so we're very glad to have Tony Feng, who's at MIT, but will be moving west to Berkeley in the fall. Uh, he's going to tell us about numerative arithmetic geometry and automorphic form. Hey, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks for everyone for being here. It's, uh, it's great to be back, if only virtually for now at Stanford. So, um, oops, clicking. okay. So the work that I'm going to describe here is all joined with Ji Wei Yun and Wei Zhang. Here they are. And um, I know this algebraic geometry seminar. It, I'll get to some kind of enumerative geometry questions, but um, but kind of from my perspective, they arise an interesting interaction um, with with the theory of automorphic forms. So some kind of uh, number theoretic aspect. So actually, I'm going to start off by giving um, some kind of example, you can think of it as a toy example of the phenomenon, which is going to be discussed um, in, in the later portions of the talk. And it has to do with maybe the simplest classical example of an automorphic form, which is called a theta series. So um, if you haven't encountered these before, a slogan you can keep in mind is that theta series, they are generating functions for counting lattice vectors. Uh, so let me give you a very concrete example. Here's a theta function it was studied by Jacobi. And uh, one way to say it is the sum over vectors in the lattice, standard lattice z to the four of uh, q to the magnitude of lambda squared. So uh, we, could, we could group it by the exponent of q. It would then be the sum over all n of um, the number of ways to write n as the sum of four squares times q to the n. So this is an example of a theta series. Uh, but what turns out to be interesting about data series is that they kind of have more structure than you would initially expect, at least uh, that you can transparently see from the definition. So um, a couple of key, pro key properties uh, that we'll focus on in this talk. One, the first one is modularity. And that uh, basically says that if I take this kind of formal generating series and I view it as an actual complex analytic function by taking Q to be E to the 2 pi IZ, then this function will have many symmetries. So you can kind of see that it's periodic because it's, it's given to you as a, as a Fourier series, but it actually, it has an additional symmetry as you exchange Z with negative one over Z, which, which does something kind of weird to Q, but, um, but that symmetry is there. And rather than kind of say more about technically what does modularity mean, let me just sort of show you a picture. So, here is the upper half plane. And uh, modularity means that the function is determined by symmetries, um, by its values in the kind of fundamental domain, such as the one I got shaded here in gray. So a priori, a periodic function is determined by its values in, in a kind of vertical strip. And then the additional symmetries of modularity tell you that really it's determined by its values in, in some kind of fundamental domain like this. Okay, so that's that first property. The second property, um, which is going to be relevant for today, is called the Ziegel Bay formula. And it, it gives a kind of identity between the Fourier coefficients that you see here, uh, number of ways to write n as a sum of four squares, and some other different looking expression. Uh, in this case, it's a eight times the sum of divisors of n, which are not themselves divisible by four. So this is a specific instance of the Ziegel Bay formula. And it might look kind of random if you haven't sort of thought about this before. Uh, it may be kind of hard to appreciate whether this, this formula is surprising or not. So let me just point out something, which is that uh, this formula makes it immediate that every n bigger than zero is a sum of four squares, because that's a question about whether the left-hand side is positive, and then the right-hand side, you can kind of visibly see is positive. For example, the divisor one contributes for every n. So this corollary at the bottom, I just mentioned it because it's a kind of interesting historical statement. Uh, it appears in uh, Diophantus' Arithmetica, at least implicitly. So it's generally regarded that um, Diophantus conjectured that this statement should be true, every natural number n is so four squares. Um, in, in kind of the literature, I think the first time it appears explicitly written is in the 1521 translation of the Di Arithmetica by Batchen. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna give a little brief sketch of the actual proof of this Ziegel Bay formula. Uh, not because like the, 
mechanics of the proof are important in this talk, but because it'll give an opportunity to introduce certain characters that, that are important. So uh, in this case, I'm gonna actually uh, assume the modularity and, and sort of show you how you use that. So this modularity property is so special that the relevant space of modular forms, uh, which contains this data series is two dimensional. One knows kind of a priori that it's finite dimensional, but here I'm saying it's actually, it's actually two dimensional. And um, then you write down some explicit basis of this two dimensional space in terms of what are called Eisenstein series. So for example, uh, an Eisenstein series is this kind of um, Fourier expansion whose coefficients are divisor sums. So this is some concept which comes from the theory of automorphic forms, Eisenstein series. And uh, one way to, that you can think about it, maybe kind of a slogan, if it's, uh, if it's not something you've seen before, is that these Eisenstein series are the modular functions that are kind of relatively easy to write down because they come by induction from simpler situations. So they're kind of induced functions. And that's what lets us write down these kinds of very explicit Fourier expansions. So uh, when all said and done, you are in this two-dimensional space, you have the uh, theta series, you have Eisenstein series, and you just do some linear, simple linear algebra to figure out how to express one in terms of the other. So by comparing a couple of Fourier coefficients, you deduce this kind of identity of these functions uh, that I've written at the bottom here. And then if you went back and extracted for each Fourier coefficient, you know, one Fourier coefficient equals the other, you would, you would get that original form of the equal base formula that I had written. Okay, so just to summarize, like we see here, we are able to use this modularity property to prove this kind of interesting numerical identity. Uh, we introduce the notion of Eisenstein series. That's really what I want to take away to the rest of the talk. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, so then let me proceed. So one thing I just want to kind of point out is that this equality, which I wrote, I was slightly coy about when exactly it is true. And if we look at it, we see that it, it doesn't really look right when n equals zero because the left-hand side, well, that's one. There's one way to write zero as a sum of four squares while the right-hand side is something that looks like it's not one. It's, it's eight times the sum of, well, <laughs> infinitely many positive integers. Um, at least if you interpret the condition that a number divides zero as it's always true, uh, which I think is a reasonable interpretation. So, so this doesn't look like a true thing. Uh, however, there is a way to kind of interpret it so that, it, so that this right-hand side, which looks like it's kind of horribly divergent, actually uh, takes some kind of finite value. Namely, there's this Riemann zeta function defined as the sum of the reciprocals of positive integers rate to the S power, uh, initially, it, it kind of makes sense. It converges when the real part of S is, is some number that's bigger than one. But as Riemann proved, it turns out to have a meromorphic continuation to the whole complex plane, regular outside S equals one. And in particular, you can make sense of the value of this function at negative one. And formally, that looks like it's like you know, sum of all the positive integers, um, but really it's some kind of analytic continuation of that notion. And it turns out to be a finite number, which is negative one twelve. And so by using this, um, this interpretation of the right-hand side, you can kind of actually regularize it to be some finite number and, and suitably interpreted, it will be equal to one, meaning it will kind of restore this equal bay identity, even when n equals zero. And I see it, it looks like it's actually gonna give you, uh, give you two. If you yeah, yeah. So this is this unit. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I guess it's the the zero being like half and like nine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Half of it or something. Yeah. Okay. I was hoping no one would <laughs> notice this, but um, it, it, there's this kind of like thing where the constant term of the Eisenstein series is really one half of the L function, and so that's that's what's going on here. You're right that there is a kind of one half which which is um, is part of the theory of Eisenstein series. Okay, uh, good point, Bjorn, but uh, moving on. So um, let's just leave it at, if you suitably use this to regular, regularize the right-hand side, then you can restore the identity even for n equals zero. So the takeaways 
uh, that we have here. Oh, sorry. So first, I want to say there's a kind of more general question. Um, so this this question about sums of four squares, as we discussed, you can think of it as a question about counting lattice vectors, counting vectors in a lattice of a given length. And interpreted that way, this is a kind of natural family of generalizations. We could look at an arbitrary, let's say, definite lattice lambda comma q, and we could assemble some kind of function, a theta series, which would be a generating function whose coefficients count the number of lattice vectors um, in lambda with uh, magnitude n under the quadratic form q. That function, well, that's, it's first a q series, but if you interpret it as a Fourier series, it is going to be modular and it's going to have its own version of the Ziegel Bay formula, which will relate uh, this theta series if you average it up over some kind of finite set to an Eisenstein series. And uh, more generally, you can, instead of counting one vector in a lattice, you can count a configuration of n vectors in the lattice lambda and write down some kind of generating function, which will now be kind of a multivariable generating function. And the Fourier- Actually, Tony, what's the average, that thing in, this, in, the, in that single bay, what is that average thing? Average, yeah, so it, it's averaging over a certain finite equivalence class of quadratic forms. Got it, okay, great. Uh, which didn't come up previously because previously that equivalence class had only one, one thing, but um, in general, this average thing is there. Thanks. Yeah, so as I was saying, even more generally, you can make kind of multi-dimensional generating functions or, or modular forms in many variables um, by counting configurations of m vectors in your lattice. And then the point I want to make here is that the generating function, its Fourier coefficients will be parameterized not by numbers, but by matrices, say matrices t. So uh, I just wanted to point that out to say that in the general story, there'll be some automorphic forms and their Fourier expansions will be parameterized by matrices instead of just numbers. And, and these are somehow equally comprehensible and understandable? Uh, that's slightly subjective, but the theory, uh, it, everything generalizes suitably, which is, which is nice. Um, as you go to sort of more complicated groups, the theory of bottom form forms you know, becomes slightly less hands-on than, uh, than kind of the usual modular forms on, on the upper half plane, but suitably, interpreted, so I think a suitably interpreted, it's kind of a completely parallel thing. So just to summarize the kind of takeaways I want you to have from this portion of the talk, the slogan was that there's these theta series, they are generating functions for counting lattice vectors of a given length. Uh, they have a couple key features from our perspective. One is a kind of symmetry called modularity. And the other is a ziegel weil formula. And I think I'll explain later why this should be viewed as a special value formula. Uh, and I also want you to keep in mind that the singular terms, meaning in the Fourier expansion, you take those terms, um, which are indexed by matrices T, if you take the ones with determinant zero, those will feature extra subtleties. So we had seen in the kind of case where, where T was a number, not a matrix, that the zeroth term, you know, it involved this kind of interesting thing where you had to regularize your, the Riemann zeta function. And I'm saying in the higher dimensional version, it's, it's all those matrices which are having determinant zero that feature some kind of similar subtlety. Okay, so this was the classical story of theta theories. But the great thing about them is that it's, it's not even really like a kind of Definition, it's like a theme, which you can play out in your favorite mathematical setting. And so uh, we are, we are actually gonna see incarnations of theta series, but in a kind of different mathematical context, a more geometric one. So uh, it's gonna be, I have this kind of little analogy here between number fields and function fields. Previously, we were discussing number fields, we we're discussing lattices, free Z modules. Now we're gonna move to a more geometric context where we talk about uh, things like vector bundles over a curve. So, uh, so I'm going to start setting up a little bit of notation to, um, to explain kind of what theory of theta series is about over function fields. So I'm going to have X, that's going to be a smooth projective curve over a finite field. And now 
because I'm going to eventually want to state like precise theorems, I'm going to have to uh, move to kind of more specific technical context. So previously I had discussed kind of quadratic forms. Actually, our theorems are for permission forms. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to shift that slightly. So we're going to be talking about permission forms in unitary groups. So we need to give ourselves a double cover of X. So that's going to be X prime. And it's going to have, it's a double cover. So it's non-trivial automorphism um, involution sigma. And for me, F will be a vector bundle on X prime, it's double cover, and H will be a Hermitian structure on F. In other words, a, a, a map from F to its conjugate dual, which is an isomorphism and which, um, yeah, which defines a Hermitian form on F. So it means H itself is sort of self, is a self conjugate dual as a map. So here's a little table of analogies. On the left, we have basically the setting we were talking about before. On the right, we have the setting that we're gonna talk about now. So previously, over a number of fields, we had discussed lattices with quadratic forms. So a lattice is a vector bundle over the integers and a quadratic form is a quadratic structure on that. Now we're gonna, our integers are replaced by this curve and we're gonna be talking about a vector bundle F on X prime and a Hermitian structure on that. Previously, we had counted elements of our lattice, which had a given norm N, or maybe more generally, collection of elements with norm matrix T. Now we're gonna talk about global sections. We're gonna count global sections of our vector bundle, kind of analogous to elements of a lattice. Um, there's a small subscript L here, which refers to some twisting, which will be explained later. So really it's better to count twisted, like twisting vector bundles by auxiliary line bundles. But, Bottom line, we're gonna count global sections of vector bundles instead of counting elements of a lattice. And uh, on the left side, we had taken these counts, we assembled them into some kind of Fourier series, and then that Fourier series had remarkable properties. And that's what we're gonna do on the right-hand side here. We're gonna take these counts of global sections and assemble them into some kind of Fourier series. So are there any questions about any of this? Uh, if not, let me go on. So, um, so let me just set up some notation. I'm gonna let bun sub un be the moduli space parameterizing these Fs and Hs that I talked about. So it's- Tony, can I ask a question actually? Oh yeah, of course. Jordan, Jordan here. Um, yeah. The, the, um, so I just wanna understand on the last slide, what would go wrong? I mean, you have this, you, you've put on this double cover on X, which doesn't have an obvious analog on the arithmetic side. What would go wrong if I just studied vector bundles on X and their global sections? Uh, okay, so the, the, the closest analog of the left-hand side would be a vector bundle on X plus a quadratic form on that vector bundle. And that would be, that should lead to the same story, except we haven't proved theorems about it because we, we haven't written papers about it. So that, that's just the- ah. So uh, another answer would be that there is an analog of the right-hand side on the left-hand side, where instead of a lattice over Z, you take a permission lattice, say over like Z joint I, something like this. Right. So I've tweaked the kind of most closest analogy by, by a little bit of technical variation, just because um, I want to state the theorem as we honestly prove it. So, so what's interesting, so I would have thought that the theorem that you haven't proved yet would be the easier one. Like I would have thought this would be strictly more complicated than just vector bundles on the, without the atomic cover. And the vector bundles the quadratic form. But you're saying it's actually, you're finding it's actually easier. Presumably you think it's easier to instead do the Hermitian case. Yeah, there's something, it's, it's not, it's maybe a little counterintuitive, but it, it turns out that certain things are simpler actually working with Hermitian rather than something orthogonal, orthogonal groups, yeah. But I don't think there's a kind of fundamental obstruction just uh, somehow we haven't gotten to that yet. Yeah, thanks for the question, I'd say. Yeah, that's a good point. This isn't the closest possible analogy. It's an analogy composed with some kind of variation of group theory. Um, okay, so my bun UN will be the modulized space of these vector bundles plus permission and forms. And, um, Really the connection between the number theory and the geometry comes from something called Bayes uniformization theorem, which says that uh, if I take the rational points of this modulized space, one UN, so that's just you know, bundles on X prime plus Hermitian forms, uh, 
that that has some adelic interpretation. It can be naturally written in terms of adels. And for the purpose of this talk, the only reason I mention that is because that's what automorphic forms are. Automorphic forms are functions on adel groups. And so we won't need to know what adels are if you don't. I mean, if you do, it's great. What we just need to know is somehow the geometry is, you know, on the left-hand side of this equation, and the the kind of automorphic forms in number theory are about things on the right-hand side. So because they're equal, we have some connection here. So the upshot of all this was that a function of bundles can be interpreted as an automorphic form via this uh, Bayes uniformization. And you know, a function that we're interested in, for example, is the one which associates to a vector bundle the number of local sections. And then we can ask, like, does this this function have some kind of automorphic meaning? So that's the kind of question we're, we're interested in. Okay, so uh, now let me talk about a variant of theta series. So this is kind of the first uh, evolution or first new incarnation of them. Uh, it's called arithmetic theta series. And sometimes this is also called the Kudla program. And this is about um, uh, behavior of special cycles in arithmetic moduli spaces. So I have a little picture here, which I pulled from a survey of Chow Lee. Uh, it's a, a, I've, in this picture, I have a product of modular curves, x equals y times y, that's an ambient sheet. And then by special cycles, I mean things like this red and blue curves inside this thing. So you can imagine this might be like the locus where, um, so, so this ambient x parameterizes two elliptic curves and this blue line parameterizes this, the locus where the two elliptic curves are actually isomorphic with each other. And the red line parameterizes the locus where the elliptic curves differ by an M isogeny. Those are what we mean by special cycles. And, and furthermore, we might be interested in counting these purple intersection points. So that's the kind of flavor of this, these problems. Uh, so there's gonna be a theory which looks formally kind of parallel um, back when we were talking about theta series, we made these Fourier series whose coefficients were the size of certain sets, the Z of N, which is the set of lattice vectors having length N. And in this arithmetic story, well, you're going to make a, Q, a formal Q expansion as before, but now the coefficients are not going to be numbers. They're going to be algebraic cycles on this ambient moduli space. So I put a little bracket Z of N, meaning the, the cycle class of some special cycle. I haven't explained to you what that special cycle is or even what the ambient moduli space kind of should be. Uh, for us, it'll be something called the moduli space of Stukas, and I will get to, get to it. But I just wanted to first convey kind of the formal appearance of the problem. It's like, now we're talking about generative series and the coefficients are cycle classes. Any questions? All right, so let me just say a little bit more about uh, what one expects. First, I'm just repeating myself here. These arithmetic theta series, they're generating functions again, but their coefficients are special cycles in some ambient moduli space. And in general, these coefficients would be parameterized by things like matrices, T. Okay, so this, this isn't something I've defined. The definition is actually kind of conjectural in general, just, just kind of what the picture should look like. And the kinds of things we want are appropriate generalizations of these two properties we said before. First, a modularity property, which says that this generating function actually has a lot more symmetries than are initially apparent from the definition. And secondly, some kind of arithmetic Ziegle Bay formula, which will relate this to Eisenstein series, except it turns out that in this case, one doesn't expect the relation to be to the Eisenstein series itself, but the Eisenstein series moves in a kind of one family deformation and one expects to find the derivative of the Eisenstein series. So uh, just to give you a little illustration. So previously I had discussed an Eisenstein series as a function of one variable Z, there were some divisor sums and the value of the zeta function at minus one involved. But really the value of the zeta function, as we know, I mean, it's this, it, the zeta function is a function of a complex variable, one complex variable. So uh, there's a deformation of the Eisenstein series where you see the whole zeta function appearing uh, as the constant 
Fourier coefficient, and you can also perturb, you can deform these divisor sums appropriately by um, by raising things to, to the kind of variable s power. So, so what, what was the, so you said the theta series is not, so you have a known moduli space of Stupid, right? And you have these known cycles. So what's that, right? What's the ambiguity in the definition of this theta? The problem is the construction of appropriate virtual fundamental classes. Uh, I see. So these classes are not of the correct dimension necessarily. That's right. Yeah. So I'll say more about that later, but, but basically, um, yeah, basically that's the problem. Like when one has a cycle, one doesn't know what to take as the, as the class. Great, perfect, thanks. Um, but, but somehow the mentality for now is we don't even, you know, this is just kind of a picture of what it expects and then you know, I'll, I'll explain the definition later. Um, but the point I, I wanted to make here was that um, here's a little summary of what we've seen about Ziegel Bay. So there's a Ziegel Bay formula. That should relate the data series to some kind of specialization of the Eisenstein series at, at some specific S value. And there's an arithmetic Ziegel Bay formula or also known as the Kudla program. And that should relate arithmetic theta series um, to the derivative of the Eisenstein series at this special value. And on the right-hand side, we could keep going. And the question is kind of like, what, what, would, what would you see on the left-hand side? So you would maybe, it'd be natural to ask if there's some kind of higher Ziegel Bay story where there's some kind of geometric generating series, which corresponds to higher derivatives of, of the Eisenstein series. And so that's, that's something which I want to get to today. That's something, a story with which we can make. So this, this was a kind of brief overview of where we want to get to. And now I'm going to backtrack and, and say a little bit more about the, the definitions and so on. Um, please feel free to interrupt if there are, if there are questions. Okay, so basically I wanted to say something about like, what is the definition of um, moduli of Stukas and these special cycles. And I'm gonna apologize a little bit because, because we're gonna start now trying to give the, the complete definition, like it'll be a little technical. So uh, rest assured that the details of the technicalities won't be used later in proofs because the proofs won't really be given uh, at the level of detail. So uh, if, if this is going, uh, feeling a little gritty, it, it, it won't be really necessary to understand the rest of the talk. But I do want to give the, the definitions. So, um, so one starts with a thing called the HECA stack, which is some kind of geometrization of the classical HECA correspondences uh, involved in the, in the theory of automorphic forms. And so what it is, it, it's a moduli space which classifies uh, a tuple of data from this moduli space of bundles, plus uh, little things that we call modifications between them. So um, you'll give a tuple of points on the curve and you'll kind of give isomorphisms uh, between these bundles. Well, not on the, not sort of on the whole curve, but restricted to the complement of these points. So this is meant to be kind of analogous to something like an isogeny between elliptic curves where that's a map, which is not really an isomorphism, but it's an isomorphism away from uh, like, uh, finite collection of primes on, on the tape module. So uh, if that's something which is more familiar, you can think of this as trying to be like some sort of linear version of, of an isogeny of elliptic curves. Um, so this HECA stack, it has sort of these uh, evident projection maps to, to, to the moduli space of bundles uh, per zero through per R. And it also has a map to the rth power of the curve, uh, which is, tracking these little points xi where these uh, maps of vector models fail to be isomorphisms. Actually, this map to the power of the rth power of the curve is kind of a key feature of the function field situation. So if that curve was spec z, then there wouldn't be any kind of meaningful ver version of the rth power of it. So that, that's kind of one, one key structure which we gain in this function field situation. Okay, so that's what this HECA stack is. And the, um, I'm gonna kind of, in the future, I'm gonna denote using, as a shorthand, the points of this HECA stack, I just think of it as kind of uh, 
R plus one bundles plus and a bunch of maps between them, which are not quite regular everywhere. So they have um, they kind of not defined a way from finding a collection of points. So I, I use dash arrows to indicate that. So that's how I'm going to indicate points of this stack in the future. So, so sigma was your involution, right? Your uh, yes, that's right. And so why is your x i's and sigma x i's are really, there's no reason to distinguish them. Um, that's true. So, and then, why, and then why are you mapping the x prime to the r rather than the quotient by that involution? Uh, yeah, it's just a little bit more precise. I mean, it's kind of a purely technical point, but. Okay. The, wanted, um, just, okay. That, so it's not a it's not that important question. I just was wondering if there was something. Okay. That's yeah. I mean, more morally, kind of yeah. It's a, it's a small bit of more refined data, but you're right that kind of the main point is well, yeah. It would be very close. Yeah. So um, so the modular space of Stukas is defined by well, there's a certain Cartesian diagram. I like to write it this way because if you maybe if you come from automorphic forms, this is suggestive. It's it's like saying we're trying to take the the fixed points of the Hecke correspondence uh, against the Frobenius. So this would be this is meant to be some kind of geometric version of of what's called the twisted trace formula. But anyway, I mean you can sort of unravel from the definition like what what is this space Stuka actually uh, parameterizing? So it should be a point of the Hecke stack, and then uh, it should identify kind of the first and last bundles you see up to, to Frobenius. So uh, in this shorthand, uh, this modular space of Stukas is parameterizing, uh, first of all, the same data as the Hecke stack, a uh, tuple of bundles F0 through FR, and kind of these modifications between them. And then in addition, you have to specify that the last bundle is isomorphic to the Frobenius twist of the first one. Okay, are there any questions? I guess just, and so if I understand correctly, you're saying that if R equals one, this is more like a more familiar thing for the number of theorists in the uh, room. Yeah, if, if R equals one and you take FQ points. So then, then we're just talking about finite sets. But then the cardinality of, of Stuka UN are FQ points uh, would be something like the twisted trace formula, uh, like the trace of some uh, of a heck operator composed with Frobenius on space of automorphic forms. So in that sense, uh, after you take FQ points, you, these bundles will become the delic delic space. The Hecke stack will become the usual Hecke correspondence. And then this fiber product, it means some kind of trace, some count of fixed points. Is that, does that satisfy the question? And this fiber product is not where the, is this where the worry about the dimension, the dimension could be off? Is this- No, that will that'll comes later when the okay. special cycles arise. So these, right. these, these things, they're perfectly well behaved like the, smooth and dimension is expected and so on. So this is just the ambient, the ambient modular space. Yeah, so I should say actually it's it's kind of like when r equals um when r equals zero then uh then the stuka is is really just a kind of discrete well, it's kind of a group void, but up to like if you crush it down to equivalent classes, then it's a discrete set, and uh, that set is kind of the count. That set is uh, the, the cardinality of that set is like what's closely related to the twisted trace of the Hakov order. Okay, so now we're going to get to these special cycles, and that that is where these kind of geometric subtleties will come up. So we want to define some special cycles. Um, technically, they're not sub varieties of the moduli space, but you can, you can imagine that they are. They're kind of finite to one over, over this ambient moduli space. Um, they're going to be indexed by kind of vector bundles on X prime. 
So Z will be a disjoint union over E's of Z sub E. So let me define this Z sub E. Um, basically, it's just going to be a map from E to F. But then um, you have to give a you have to give a family of, of compatible maps from E to each F I. And it has to be the case that the, this last map, it's a map from E to the uh, Frobenius twist of F0. It should be the Frobenius twist of the first map. So let's think about the case where R equals zero. When R equals zero, these intermediate uh, columns don't exist. You just have a bundle. It's identified with its own Frobenius twist. Then you give a map from E, with, and that map is itself stable under Frobenius. So that, that means that um, this, is, this is just uh, counting the number of maps from E to F um, in, in the usual sense. So it's kind of like a version of global sections, but twisted by this bundle with E. That, that's the sense in which this is analogous to counting global sections of vector bundle and, and therefore counting vectors in the lattice. So it's when, when R equals zero, this is gonna specialize to that version of theta series we discussed before. And it's really when R equals one and two and R is positive that these become positive dimensional cycles. So I know, I know this diagram is kind of uh, a mouthful. So are there any questions about this? Okay. So now what is this T thing doing? Well, I have a map from E to FI. But FI has a Hermitian structure, so I can apply that, map FI to its own conjugate dual. And then I can go backwards using the dual of the TI. And at the end, I'll get some map from E to its own conjugate dual. Um, so so that, that's a, defining a map from this a special cycle to this, uh, this linear vector space over FQ. So it's a finite set. And um, th this is exactly the, the set of T's. So T is really an element of this palm space, finite dimensional vector space over FQ. And the Z, the special cycle Z, E, R of T is the fiber over T. T Tony, are you using sigma in two different ways? Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> the, the sigma on the, yeah, sorry about this. The, um, the sigma in the diagram should be Frobenius. Uh, yeah, kind of in the paper we use. Sorry about that. You're, you're exactly right, Richard. The sigma in this commutative diagram should be Frobenius, and then the other sigma is the involution. Also, this composition depends on i, right? So for each i, you have a different map. Basically, it it, lo it looks like that, but because of the condition on the commutative diagram makes it independent of i. But you're right; it kind of a priori it looks like it. So. The, the condition cutting out the special cycle was, uh, implies that it's independent of i. Okay, so um, something to keep in mind is the example where e is the trivial bundle but raised to some mth power, let's say. In that case, the ti really just means a collection of m global sections of fi. And then the t is this kind of m by m matrix of pairwise commission products of each global section. So. That's why I kind of say like, you can think of T as a matrix. Um, so th this example hopefully is, uh, looks a little closer to what one expects for classical data series. Okay, so uh, here's what we know about these special cycles. So if E has rank M, then uh, this thing has expected co-dimension MR and Expected, it means something in some certain intuitive sense, but in particular, it means that the correct cycle class, which you want to assign, has co dimension MR. Uh, that's what's expected. But what's actually true? Well, when in, in specific cases, when M equals one and this matrix T is non singular, then actually this expectation is met. The thing actually is LCI and it has co dimension R. Uh, but in general, the geometry is difficult to control. And uh, just as kind of example, if this matrix T is zero, then actually this special cycle is, you know, it's not really special. It dominates the whole moduli space. Even though, as we said, like um, 
the, the, the virtual class, I mean, it, it has expected co-dimension R times the rank of E. So again, let me just scroll back. So the reason why it dominates the whole modular space is pretty simple. It's just that every vector bundle has the zero global section. So you can always take these TIs to be zero. That of course for, forces your matrix capital T to be zero, but um, that, that is allowed. So, um, so kind of in this most degenerate case where this Fourier coefficient is zero, uh, this, this special cycle is, is the whole moduli space. It's kind of analogous to how we discussed in this classical story of theta series, like the condition that number divides n is vacuous when n equals zero. It's like that. Like you, you see the sum of all positive integers. So, so that's what's going on here. Um, and what, what we really want to do is we want to construct virtual classes, uh, which which do have the correct properties. In particular, the codimension should be this expected codimension MR. So that's the kind of enumerative geometry aspect of it. Okay. Are there any questions? So, so these are going to be in this this power series. These are you're going to stick these in a power series, and is it that? Yeah. Uh, it, 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 and so this is something where, like, in general, like, would arbitrarily mean the coefficients have this problem, or do you have a situation where once R, once you go far enough out in the power series, everything's of the expected dimension, or you just can't, you just really can't tell? Uh, the best thing I can say is the second bullet point. So That's um, it. when M equals one, yeah, then things are, and T is non-singular, things are well behaved beyond that. And especially mm -hmm. as R grows, I would expect, I think, you know, for fixed parameters, and then you and then you increase R. I would expect everything to become kind of badly behaved geometrically. Right. So rather than better, it's going to be worse. Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, so here's what we know. So we can construct these virtual fundamental classes, and um, they exist for each R. When R equals zero, you recover the classical theory of data series. When R equals one, you recover kind of the less classical but known theory of arithmetic data series. But when R is two or higher, it's, it's really some kind of new thing. And it fits into this higher is equal to a formula. Um, so for that, we kind of have to take the rank of this bundle E to be such that the special cycle is zero dimensional. So it's kind of equivalent to a collection of points and we can count the number of points. Um, so that's what I mean by this kind of left-hand side here. If I have a zero cycle and I uh, write this integration sign, that, that really just means count up the number of points. So the theorem is that if T is non-singular, then this counting, this integrative geometry question, it will uh, be up to some normalization constant. It'll be equal to the, the R derivative of that sign series. So can you say again, you, so I think you, you did say it, but is it, a, why is it zero dimensional or, or it's always zero dimensional or when it's, this is when it's zero dimensional? Uh, when, when, so the co-dimension um, kind of goes up as the rank of E increases. Right. Uh, so I, I didn't fully explain this, but it has expected co-dimension M times R right. and the maximal, the dimension of the ambient space is N times R. So when M equals N is kind of when the special cycle is the smallest. Right. But you're, are you expecting some meaning for the higher cycle value? Um, not an enumerative meaning, but there will be something to say about that later. Yeah. But like, like the right side would be some chow value, derivative some nice chow value thing. Uh, we, don't, we don't know how to formulate which modular form it is, but just, just the statement that it is modular is already kind of non-trivial thing. So that, that'll be the statement. Tony, is it easy to say why there's no analog of having to average over the genus like you do in the usual Ziegel Bay? Or is uh, there, I can't see it. So, so this integration actually is performing the step of averaging of the genus. This, oh, this that's what Robbie said in the chat. Okay. Yeah, integration over the ambient moduli space is, is kind of averaging over the genus. Um, yeah, good question though. Okay, so when R equals zero, this formula recovers equal bay. When R equals one, it proves some kind of arithmetic equal bay formula. It wasn't actually known previously in this context, but kind of the novelty here is that you have an identity for every R, and that and that doesn't really it doesn't really matter what the order of vanishing of anything is. It's kind of a new principle of number theory. I mean, there's many classical conjectures like Burton's Spinner and Dyer, where 
um, you conjecture the leading order term of some function has some have some other meaning. But here, there's a meaning no matter what the actual order vanishes. Is. So, um, so let me just say a few words about the proof. So there's this thing called the function sheaf dictionary. Uh, given the sheaf on a variety of a finite field, you can cook up a function on its rational points for each rational point, which is fixed by point fixed by Frobenius, take the trace of Frobenius on the stock of that sheaf. So you can go from a sheaf to a function. And then there's a kind of other direction, which is, which is kind of like a heuristic where if you have interesting functions, uh, natural functions, you, you might hope they come from natural sheaves. Of course, that's, that's, um, it's not really a well-defined thing. I'm mean, trying to like recover a vector space from its trace, but, but roughly speaking, I'm going to, refer, by categorification, I'm going to refer to the procedure of trying to find a sheaf, which recovers your function in this way. And what we want is some statement that, um, a quality of numbers. So you want, you have some special zero cycle, you take its degree, that's a number. You want that number to be equal to some kind of automorphic number, a derivative of an Eisenstein series. Um, you could also view this as an identity of functions where the numbers depend on this Fourier coefficient t. So we could say this is an identity of functions on Fourier space. And what we do is we kind of categorify the story. We, we find a sheaf on Fourier space whose associated function is basically the left-hand side. Um, so that's the sheaf f enum. It categorifies the degrees of special cycles. We find a sheaf on Fourier space, which categorifies the right-hand side, the Fourier coefficients of either side series. And we actually prove that these two sheaves are isomorphic. And you can deduce the um, quality of these numbers by, by taking this uh, trace of Frobenius. So one might ask, are we doing this because we can or because we have to? And you know, So it, it turns out that the, the sheaf theoretic perspective is important. And the reason is, is somehow that the functions on this discrete set y of fq, they don't really have any structure. Like they, they don't really know anything about the geometry of y. So kind of, for example, given the value of this function on the rational points of an open dense subset u, you still can't really say anything about the value of the function on the whole thing. Um, by contrast, sheaves have a lot of structure. These perverse sheaves have a lot of structure. So what exactly this perverse sheaf means is not that important, but let me just say the category of perverse sheaves is Artinian. It's like the category of representations of finite group. And it means that every object can be decomposed into finitely many irreducible pieces. And furthermore, those irreducible pieces, which are called intersection complexes, they can be recovered from their restrictions to dense open subsets. So, um, so that they're actually quite a rigid object. And basically, uh, this principle allows us to analytically, analytically continue an isomorphism between sheaves from just knowing the isomorphism on, the, on an open subset where they become much simpler. So that's the kind of principle at play to prove uh, this, this type of isomorphism. And this principle cannot be executed at the level of functions. So it's really important for this that we, we lift this story to a more structured one of sheaves and then do it. Okay, uh, are there any questions? Okay, if not, let me move on. So um, I'm gonna skip this picture. So let me just say that the defect of the theorem is that it, I stated this hypothesis that T is non-singular and that was essential. One reason it's essential is because we didn't know how to define one of the sides uh, when T was singular. But actually now, and I'm gonna explain this, we do know how to define it, but nevertheless, there's still some kind of problem in the theorem because although it's defined, it's no longer proper. So it's a zero cycle, but potentially like an infinite one. So kind of difficulty formulating uh, what, what its degree would be. But, but let me go on to this thing we've learned about defining these, these virtual uh, cycle classes. So um, just to kind of recap the issue, they're kind of poorly behaved in general. For example, the dimension might be larger than what you expect. Um, so what you need to do is construct something called a virtual fundamental class. And, and that means just find some way to make a definition that has the correct dimension. So you can think of this as a kind of regularization problem. 
it's like a toy model would be if I said, you know, and take the intersection of two lines in the plane and tell me the number of intersection points, then typically you would expect the answer to be one, like in this left panel here. But if the lines were presented in some kind of very degenerate position, like say they were the same line, then you take the intersection, you get a whole lines of intersection points and it looks like the answer is infinite. Like, so you have to somehow make sense of this infinity. Uh, it really should be a finite number. It's kind of like this, the regularization that we talked about at the beginning with L functions. So, um, so we, uh, we eventually realized that, that kind of a good solution to this problem is using derived algebraic geometry. And this, I think this is not a kind of a new principle to the numerator geometry, but it's kind of in, in the context of arithmetic geometry automorphic forms, it was kind of a new thing. And so let me say a little bit about why this helps. So first of all, what is it? <laughs> so algebraic geometry is a, a type of geometry which you build locally from commutative rings, right? From affine schemes. And derived algebraic geometry is a type of geometry which you build from something a little more structured than commutative rings, something which is morally topological commutative rings. Although different people might use different technical models of this word topological. So I, I use simplicial because I want to work in positive characteristic. Uh, I think Michael Savas gave a very nice talk here. Where he, he used differential graded. So that's okay because he's in characteristic zero. Anyway, intuitively, it's meant to be a topological commutative ring. An analogy to keep in mind is that the um, relationship between ordinary schemes and derived schemes is analogous to the relationship between reduced schemes and schemes. In particular, for every derived scheme X, uh, it kind of has a closed embedding from something called is classical truncation, which is an ordinary scheme. And that, that embedding looks analogous to the embedding of the underlying reduced scheme into an ordinary scheme. So, um, one thing you learn if, when you're reading Robbie's notes is that you can think of schemes as like reduced schemes plus a little bit of fuzz, which tracks their non reduced structure. And similarly, you can think of derived schemes as like schemes plus a little bit of fuzz. And that fuzz is tracking some kind of derived non reducedness. Okay. So, in the interest of time, let me um, skip kind of like what, what exactly this classical truncation is, but it, it exists. And here are some examples of how you might start out living your life in the world of classical schemes and you would somehow encounter the derived scheme. So uh, one thing is, this is kind of illustrated in a toy model, you could have two maps of ordinary schemes and then you try to take their fiber product. Uh, that's the underlying classical truncation of, of something called the derived fiber product, which you build out of taking at the level of rings derived tensor products. And while the classical fiber product thing, it may be kind of hard to predict what its dimension is. For example, you have to ask yourself, like, are things transverse or not? In the derived world, uh, one, one problem that it solves is these questions go away, like kind of everything looks transverse in some kind of derived sense. Uh, another example is um, sometimes you construct a derived thing by taking a moduli problem and just extending the definition of that moduli problem to topological commutative rings. So initially, a scheme is defined by a moduli problem. It's defined on commutative rings. Maybe there's a natural way to phrase that problem when the ring has additional structure, topological structure. And um, the point of this is that there's this kind of hidden smoothness philosophy that when in nature you encounter a, a moduli space which is really singular, it's, let's say it's non-LCI and it doesn't have the dimension you expect then you want to imagine that it comes by classical truncation from uh, some kind of natural derived moduli space that does have the correct properties that's particular quasi smooth which is a derived version of being lci so uh, quasi smooth spaces they always have an intrinsic notion of a fundamental class and more generally quasi smooth morphisms have an intrinsic notion of a relative fundamental class and you can interpret that thing as a virtual class on the underlying classical truncation. So uh, all the virtual classes which I know of are expl explained in this way that they really come from some kind of well-behaved draft object. Uh, here's a little cartoon uh, of, of kind of this process of classical truncation. So uh, uh, in the upper part, I'm drawing things which are meant to be like smooth and one-dimensional. And I think of this process of 
classical truncation is like projecting your geometry to some plane. You forget about certain derived dimensions. And when you do that, you can introduce singularities and, and maybe your thing no longer looks like it has the correct dimension. So, um, so this is a kind of cartoon of like, what, when we see things like in this bottom projection, we should really imagine they could come from something well behaved like, like in, uh, above it. Okay, so here's another example, which is relevant to the, the problem of the theta series. So I, I, I was talking before about E's and F's. Um, they, they live in some moduli space of bundles, let's say DLM bundles, so vector bundles of rank M times conversion bundles of rank N. And there's this thing called the Hitchin stack, whose fiber over E comma F is just maps from E to F. So this is kind of relevant to special cycles because th those work parameterizing global sections or maps from E to F. And this map from M to bun times bun doesn't look like it has great properties. Like it's not even flat. Right? So the, the fibers are smooth. They are vector spaces, but they have varying dimension. But um, what would you want to imagine is that there's some kind of derived version of this M whose fiber over E comma F is, is not the space of maps, but kind of the derived space of maps or the arhoms from E to F. That arhom is, is represented by, by two term complex. And it's something that we know has the correct dimension. It has the correct Euler characteristic. So if F and E vary continuously, that arhom, its Euler characteristic varies continuously. This is an example of, of how the derivedness corrects the problem that this, um, the map from the derived Hitchin stack to M bun times bun actually is quasi smooth. Um, in fact, it is, it's kind of, a, it comes from a perfect complex by a process analogous to how a vector bundle comes from a locally free sheaf. So for that reason, we call it a derived vector complex. And okay, so let me just wrap up with a couple of um, the, the last theorems. So one goal in this story is to define appropriate virtual fundamental classes so that when you take their assemble them into Fourier series, that thing will have many symmetries. It'll be modular. And uh, the theorem is that there is some appropriate definition of these virtual classes so that we know at least that this theta series is modular after you take the realization from Chow groups to cohomology and after you restrict to the generic fiber, meaning you know, the moduli space mapped to X to the R and you take the generic fiber of that map. There's an asterisk here because it, the details aren't written up yet. It's a theorem maybe completed as of three weeks ago in our minds, but uh, so, so there's, a, there's a small caveat, but uh, I think this should work. And um, let me just say one or two minutes about the idea, kind of the new ideas of, of, this, of this proof. So as we had discussed, there's this function sheaf dictionary, which is important to us. Like given a sheaf with endomorphism, you can take the trace and get a function on the fixed points. And there's a kind of new principle at play that we were using here, a variant of the old one, which is that, which is allowing you to produce from sheaves cohomology classes instead of functions. And what you do is you start with a sheaf and then you give yourself a derived correspondence from the sheaf to itself. So it, the word correspondent, okay, it's not exactly a map, but you think of it as a map in the derived category between F and its own shift in the derived category. And you can somehow keep it. So, so this is the, okay, great. This is a preemptive answer to the question I was gonna ask about. So we know how to categorize functions that for a long time, like that. You want yeah. to, but if you have cohomology or child classes, I mean, yeah, uh, cohomology or child classes, you always, uh, how do you say categorify? And you're saying this is the. Yeah, this, this would be, this would be the answer for us. Yeah. We. And why do you say cohomology rather than child? Uh, it, it, it would be, yeah, I guess it's a question of what category of sheep. So it, it could be bridged to produce answers in child, except other parts of the arguments wouldn't work for that. Like, so good. But yeah, th this part would work. We could make something in the chat group using this instead of cohomology. Um, but yeah, exactly. That's the, somehow the point is like this cohomology classes, we can also lift that, we can categorify that to, to sheaves and appropriate direct correspondences. Um, so we realize slash define our virtual class as the trace of the derived correspondence arises in this way. Oh, sorry, one and, more thing. The, the, the I is the dimension of the, is like the degree of the cohomology class? Exactly, yes, that's what the I is, yeah. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to show modularity for these like chi use plus derived correspondences instead of co multi classes. And once again, like why are we doing this? Is it because we can or because we, <laughs> because we have to? So, what do we gain by this categorification? So, um, here's what the answer is. So, the classical proof of modularity for theta series relies on some kind of Fourier duality, technically plus on summation. Uh, we don't have this kind of Fourier duality for co multi classes, but we do have it for sheaves. So Delin and Lamont invented a kind of Fourier transform for a vector bundle V over scheme S. It's an elliptic Fourier transform going from the sheaves on V to sheaves on the dual. So when we lift things to sheaves, we can use tools like this, except this quite is, isn't quite good enough for us. So there's, we need, we don't actually see vector bundles, but we see kind of more exotic objects, but we can realize that they come from some kind of derived Fourier duality. They fit under a derived Fourier duality. And that, that'll say that if you have a perfect complex on S, you can still make kind of total space, but it's not in a scheme anymore. It'll be kind of a vector bundle, a derived vector complex. Sorry, it'll be a derived vector complex, but it'll still have a kind of derived elliptic Fourier transform. And, um, and using that, we can somehow execute uh, a sheaf theoretic version of this, of this Poisson summation argument. So uh, suitably viewed, it is some kind of natural evolution of, of this classical proof of modularity using, using Fourier duality. So the total complex of K, if I understand, you're saying that's like some sort of geometric object. Like v was a geometric object. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a V geometric object. Okay, okay. That, it, it, it. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I said I'm already out of time. So let me just uh, stop there. Thank you for your attention.